Benchmark, the voice of business. Presented by LMD. On this edition of Benchmark, we talk to the recently appointed President of the Commonwealth Association of Architects, Rukshan Vidyalankara. Then, we analyze the latest BCI data with Nielsen's Managing Director, Shahin Kader. And finally, columnist Samantha Amarasinghe discusses Sri Lanka's macroeconomic outlook. That's the lineup for Benchmark. Hello and welcome to Benchmark, the big picture business program. I'm Savitri Rodrigo. With the city of Colombo undergoing a facelift and the skyline set to change very dramatically in the next few years with the construction of five and seven star hotels, architecture is certainly a hot topic these days. Now, amidst claims in some quarters that the local architects are not being given a chance to contribute to this boom that we are seeing in Sri Lanka's infrastructure sector, we caught up with leading architect Rukshan Vidyalankara, who in fact was just appointed the president of the Commonwealth Association of Architects. Rukshan, congratulations. We are so proud of you to have a Sri Lankan up there as the president of the Commonwealth Association of Architects. Now, tell me, given this appointment, what does this mean for the architectural uh, profession here in Sri Lanka? And also just give me a little bit of information about the association and its role in the global architecture industry. Uh, Commonwealth, as you would know, is a very large organization coming from the four corners of the globe. Uh, Commonwealth Association of Architects is, uh, is what is called the uh, accredited para-Commonwealth professional association. There are 34 Commonwealth countries in the membership and, and which has linkages to all over the Commonwealth. Now, the Commonwealth Savitri covers about 2 billion population, that's about one third of the world's population. So these architects in our association represent that amount of uh, people. Now, the Commonwealth Association of Architects has been in existence for the last 50 years. In 2015, we'll be celebrating our 50 years. Uh, that will be some event to attend. It will be in London. Uh, with that, we are in for a change. We are change in terms of our branding. Now, so far, uh, Commonwealth Association of Architects has been involved in things like accreditation, education, that is one of the leading edu architectural education accreditation setups in the world. Now, in as much as what Sri Lanka can get, there are a lot of things that Sri Lanka also can give to the Commonwealth. Now, for instance, um, with the Chogam that is coming up in November, uh, you know, there is Sri Lanka could show what we have done in the last 50 years. Uh, for instance, uh, what is called the pluralism in architecture. Our architecture has been, our buildings have been very inclusive. Back on home ground, Rukshan, where do you think Sri Lanka's architectural landscape is heading? Savitri, I think this question is posed as a result of the, some of the mega developments that are coming up uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, particularly in Colombo and also. Though are, those are mainly not only buildings, those are in terms of infrastructure as well. Now, one of the issues we have is that there is very little local input for those buildings. Uh, which is true. Uh, I can imagine the reason, but for some reason there is no technology transfer. Now that's where the Commonwealth Association of Architects also could come in. Now one of the things that we will be doing is uh, we have what is called the P4P, Project for Partnerships, within the Commonwealth of Nations. That is, if there are some countries that have done uh, s some similar projects, then the, maybe from another country like Sri Lanka, they could tie up with them under a certain guideline and under certain criteria which is monitored by the Commonwealth Association of Architects. Now that option is available now for some of these major projects that are coming out. So with that I hope everybody will be making use of this facility to, uh, to bid for or to pitch for these projects, all, t all kinds of stakeholders, let it, I mean, it need not be only architects, it could be engineers, contractors, suppliers and so on. Now, the, with that, I would think the, the Sri Lankan architecture would change into a more kind of a domestic, uh, sustainable 
particular type of buildings. What we see now is a very abstract set of paintings like buildings coming up uh, which are not very sustainable. Uh, I think those are things that the government also will have to look at uh, because the, 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 the footprint of those buildings are quite large, uh, what is called the carbon footprint. So that has to be controlled in some way. And also the affordability also is a factor now with such a large development coming up, uh, how do we sell these things? Uh, I don't want to be very pessimistic, but I think we, if some careful attention is not given, some of those projects might not reach uh, reap the benefits or the, the fruition that it is expected. What are your thoughts on the city beautification project? How effective will these changes be? Uh, I think anyone in his sane mind will not say anything bad about it. It's a fantastic thing that is happening. But this word beautification, I have heard it many a times. I don't think it does any justice to the work that is happening. It's not beautification we see. In our terms, technically, we call it uh, urban regeneration. And these are some of the isolated situations in urban re regeneration like uh, pedestrian promenades, green lungs, uh, pathways and coming, you know, that kind of thing. There are, there are much more to it. I hope it will go beyond this. It will it, go beyond this stage of uh, uh, having urban lungs and few buildings uh, you know, and so on, where, you, where there's a holistic kind of development, where you know, the, it's, it's affordable, one thing, and it's sustainable to this country. And at the same time, it could be built at a cost that is affordable to people. Uh, there's no point in building something that is that can be afforded only, only by uh, maybe the elite. Uh, but it's a fantastic thing in, in a way because uh, I know how difficult to get such a thing done. Uh, the amount of bureaucracy and the red tape is enormous. So somehow we have been able to cut across those things and we have been able to achieve this. I think it's a great achievement. Uh, but it has to be taken to the next phase. We're taking a short commercial break now and when we return, we, as I mentioned, Rukshan will be continuing this discussion and he will tell us a little bit more about emerging trends in architecture as well as how we're going to improve productivity in the construction and architectural industry. Stay with us. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. We're back on Benchmark. Thank you for staying with us. So we continue our interview with the newly appointed president of the Commonwealth Association of Architects, Rukshan Vidyalankara. Rukshan, we were discussing earlier, now, or oh, we were opining earlier actually, that local architects can contribute towards the ongoing boom in the infrastructure development. But how can they, given that they have been somewhat sidelined? Uh, our local input is very minimal. Uh, very recently there was a new item, one of the large building projects that is coming up in Fort. They had given the list of people involved. There wasn't a single Sri Lankan name, uh, nowhere to be found. There should be, I think as a developing nation, we are trying to come into grips with all these various issues in the uh, world. There should be a lot of discussion on this. I think the government also should take, take note of this. We are the local architects and local engineers are not, uh, as you said, have been sidelined. 
Now, one of the reasons is that the most of the developers, they are coming with their funding and they want to do it here. But in other parts of the world, these things have their certain control that there has to be a local counterparts and so on because that counterpart will ensure a lot of things happening. It is not only uh, to as a signatory but to ensure that our culture is maintained and that uh, there is a lot of social aspects are also looked into and there is also impo most important thing is the technology transfer. How do you rate uh, the actual labour component in our construction industry? Does it match up to global standards? Our labour uh, match up to any standard in the world and some of the developing countries, some of the developing contractors for instance use our labour, our skilled labour for instance because it's easily they can, they can be educated there because their background, their language, uh, they are very easily, they could be put into various kind of situations. In that context I think we have a, we have a edge over most of the other countries and it is, it is on record. Uh, some of these developing nations coming and saying that, look, uh, our, uh, our work strength, uh, that is skilled as well as unskilled, is quite good. But we have not been able to capitalize on this. We have been losing people. So we train a large number of people and with one uh, plane load, they are all gone. Now that is the, that's where the issue is. I think unless they are looked after very well, their salaries are paid, they, they have high wages, we will not be able to retain them in this global context. Now how can that be done? Now that, can, that can't be just done by paying them higher salaries or asking someone asking to increase the, the wages. It has to work through the system. That means the contractor has to be paid for that matter. For the contractor to be paid, the contractor's uh, payment should be safeguarded. There should not be bad debts. Now, in most of our situations, the final payments go bad. 5% uh, to 10% go always go bad. So, what happens? That is get built into this. Then the tax structure is such that 60% uh, is direct and indirect taxes. You get uh, from the import duties to various other duties. So, all that get built into this and therefore, as a result, you have no you have very little uh, cushion to give it in terms of higher wages. Rukshan, just getting back to a subject that you brought up earlier, that is the rising construction costs. Never is a project, uh, does a project ever remain within the budgeted costs when it begins and then by the time it ends. You're dealing with uh, having to import resources you're dealing with the rupee depreciating, you're dealing with very high transport costs and, and a host of other, you know, energy, things like that. Uh, so what measures can the industry actually take to assuage some of these, these problems which are not going away, that's for sure? Yeah, the, uh, there is actually a lot the industry can do with the industry has been doing. One is this, the industry has been absorbing some of these things, which is not a very healthy situation. Uh, because most of these things are outside the control of the construction industry. So when it is outside their control, there is very little that they could also do to control, to, to arrest the situation. But I think it has to be done at the governmental level uh, in trying to, you know, sort of do these things. Uh, our tax structure is such that it is very, very high. Uh, so what happens when the structure is high? It gets built into the construction cost, right? And it gets built in, then it, when it keeps on changing, that also gets built in once again. So in order to keep a safe buffer, obviously the, the OH and the profits component has to go up, because otherwise somebody might incur a loss the end, uh, at the end of the project. Now this is like a vicious cycle. Now in some of the uh, developed countries, a project is planned way ahead, uh, about three years, there is a two year project planning, uh, planning uh, timeline. Now in our situations, we don't have that, it's, it's very good to have that, that kind of timeline, but here if we have it, that project will not materialize because by the time of you are finished planning the project, your, uh, the playing field has changed, so that project is no more viable then. So that is the situation we have. So as a result, we go in and do the designs, we go in do the construction uh, and then we finish the building before anything could happen. 
So, I my firm belief is that unless the government takes a uh, very strong step in arresting the construction cost, there is always the intervention and the support given by the association, the contractors, engineers, you name it, contractors, they are always there to help. They can give whatever the, uh, they have been giving whatever the required know-how and the uh, service, but I think it has to come at the higher level. For professionals in the architectural sector, does the supply actually uh, meet the demand? The supply at present meets the demand, if you ask me, uh, but there is much more to be done in the regions. Now the professionals, <coughs> particularly architects, are mostly grouped in Colombo and the suburbs. There aren't many uh, professionals, engineers and architects working in outskirts in the regions for that matter even in Kandy or even in one of the main cities there are only very few people. To get them out there is also is not easy. We have uh, many years ago I remember the Srinaka Institute of Architects tried this but uh, it didn't work. So in that context to make it uh, Sri Lankan wide to make our footprint larger I don't think we have enough people. Uh, but we are also capable of doing that. Our architects are capable of uh, making, uh, you know, putting into any situations, doing any type of buildings for that matter. And they are they can learn very, very fast. I think that's one of the key. They can learn very fast some of the products they do. Uh, some of the architects, sometimes some of the architects, architecture they produce, particularly the younger group, is uh, world class. Uh, in many of the exhibitions and many of the competitions that uh, Sri Lankan architects have been going, they have got a very high rating and uh, they have got, and that is without any formal, um, uh, I would say, uh, formal preparation to present themselves in those places. They have got a very formal, uh, uh, formal system of education to, to be architects, but to make a presentation over there. Uh, with all these high flown technology and so on, uh, we don't have that facility, there is no one, you know, sort of training us. Uh, in that context, they have done very well. What are the emerging trends in architecture that we are seeing? The, there is a strong tendency towards the nature. That is, I think, number one. There is very strong, everybody wants to have a plot of garden. Even if you build at the maybe 20th floor, there is uh, people wanting to see and touch a plant or a tree or a leaf. In that context, some of the buildings we see now that are coming up have tried to address this, have tried to build this nature into in terms of vertical parks and so on. That's I see it as a positive trend but there is a lot more that has to happen it has to happen actually in a very positive way not as a eye wash uh, so i would like to see a sri lanka or colombo developing in that context uh, with passive ventilation with least amount of energy uh, with the least amount of inconvenience with a very fast construction method construction systems, that is what uh, I would look at Sri Lanka to be in the next 20 years, which I think is also is very quite possible and is manageable. Uh, it's, it's not very far off. Well, let's hope good sense will prevail. Thank you very much, Rukshan. Thank you very much, Saiji. We've been speaking with the president of the Commonwealth Association of Architects, Rukshan Vidya Lankara, who gave us a little bit of information about the profession, where it's going, and also what's happening in the architectural landscape here in Colombo and in some parts of the world. On the other side, we have the Managing Director of Nielsen, Shahin Khader, who will give his insights on the Business Confidence Index. And just after that, economist and LMD columnist Samantha Amrasinghe adding her expertise.
When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. Hello and welcome back to Benchmark. I'm Anushan Selvaraj and with me now is Managing Director of Nielsen, Shaheen Kader, with the latest in the BCI. Now, uh, Shaheen, the BCI is marginally up by 7 points to 147, but this also represents a slowdown in the upward momentum se seen since last June. Now, uh, in, the, in, the, in this month's issue of LMD, you mentioned that we have encountered a stalemate of sorts. Uh, could you elaborate on this statement? Yeah, I think uh, the crawl back up of the BCI seems to have sort of leveled off for the last three months, I would say. And uh, I think these are due to concerns that the business sector has on the economy, inflation, interest rates, and so on. Now, where do respondents see the economy heading over the next 12 months, Shine? Uh, interestingly, Anshan, the op opinion is divided. Uh, about half see actually the economy improving. However, the other half are concerned that the economic climate would decline or remain stagnant. According to this month's poll, a quarter of respondents say that the investment climate is poor compared to 15% who said so in February. Now, what is the reason behind this major shift in sentiment? Uh, the high, I think the high cost of finance is the, re is the key reason because, I mean, people are borrowing at, uh, for business use at about 20% or over. And um, uh, this is actually unprecedented in most countries, even in Asia or even the rest of the world. And uh, therefore, you know, this is a primary concern. Uh, I think the other reasons really would be of secondary uh, importance. Shaheen, what are your projections for the BCI? Will it improve anytime soon, in, in your opinion? I think uh, it should crawl back up uh, rather than, you know, shoot back up. Uh, and um, I think this is also a lot to do with uh, how the, the rest of the economy sort of c contributes in terms of trade, in terms of uh, the agricultural sector and so on. So um, I think um, I'm fairly optimistic, so let's wait and see. That was the Managing Director of Nielsen, Shaheen Kader. After a short commercial break, Nishu Hashim speaks to LMD columnist and economist Samantha Amarasinghe with the latest on the economy. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Benchmark. I'm Nishu Hashim and with me now is economist for Standard Chartered Bank and LMD columnist Samantha Amarasinghe. Now Samantha, in this month's issue of LMD, you say that there are three reasons for a slower than expected recovery in our economy. Could you elaborate on them? Well, yes, um, we highlight three reasons uh, for this slower than expected recovery. Uh, firstly, uh, we feel that uh, more fiscal consolidation is required. Um, as you know, Sri Lanka's fiscal position um, has historically been weak due to a very narrow tax base. Um, in fact, we have a tax-to-GDP ratio of around 12 percent, um, large interest payments which amount to around uh, 25 percent of expenditure, extensive subsidies um, and a bloated public sector um, with civil servant salaries. Um, the other two reasons I'd like to highlight are that inflation still remains elevated um, despite easing somewhat to 7.5% in March from its peak of 9.8% uh, in February. Um, but this easing has largely been due to uh, base effects and uh, so we still feel that um, 
there'll be limited room for near-term policy easing. And uh, finally, the third reason um, is that the recovery in Sri Lanka's main trading partners, um, the European Union and uh, US, uh, still remains anemic. Now, what about our current account deficit, which remains high? How does this affect the economy, and has the government made any progress in attempting to control the deficit? As you correctly point out, um, Sri Lanka's current account deficit remains large, and uh, this has a substantial impact on the country's external position. Uh, moreover, exports are unlikely to pick up this year, as reflected uh, even in the latest January trade data, which shows an 18% drop in exports compared to January last year. And uh, we feel the government has taken steps to control the deficit with the corrective measures it put in place in 2012 to control imports expenditure. And this has had uh, results with imports also falling substantially over the past year or so. So uh, overall, the current account deficit uh, should continue to narrow, um, not only due to strong uh, foreign exchange receipts from trade, but also from tourism. Sri Lanka's fiscal position has been weak historically due to a narrow tax base. Now, fiscal consolidation is underway, but little seems to have been done to deal with structural shortfalls in public finances. Why is that the case? It definitely uh, seems that way as we have not seen a marked improvement on the revenue side. Um, tax revenue collection is less than 11.5% of GDP and is among the lowest in Asia as a consequence of uh, falling imports and uh, various tax administration issues. Um, so although some uh, progress has been made uh, since the 2011 budget uh, on reforming the tax system, uh, through simplifying it as well as broadening the tax base, uh, there's still a lot more that needs to be done. Um, so yes, uh, fiscal consolidation is underway, but we feel that progress has been uh, very slow in addressing uh, some of the structural shortfalls in public finances. Um, you will find that fiscal consolidation last year, which brought the deficit down to 6.2% uh, from 6.9%, uh, was achieved partly due to uh, delays in uh, capital expenditure and, in fact, not due to tax revenues, uh, which remained weak. Uh, so there is a lot more to be done. And in our view, uh, the government's 5.8% uh, fiscal deficit target for 2013 um, is based on a substantial increase in uh, revenue of around 19%, um, which we feel will be uh, very difficult to achieve. Um, the poor performance of the state oil and electricity companies uh, will continue to act as a fiscal drag. And uh, moreover, also in the absence of a new IMF program, uh, the government will really need to adhere to uh, stricter fiscal discipline. That was Economist with Standard Chartered Bank and LMB columnist Samantha Amarasinghe. Thank you for watching and we hope you enjoyed the show. See you again next time.